critically important. If I can preach this message to America, I'd preach it to America. And it's coming from a passage that every one of you, if you've been in the church like I have most of my life, you'd have the Bible verse memorized. Even, I guess even in my day, as a young person in school, you might even learn that Bible verse in school. We don't do that anymore today. In fact, most of our kids today are basically trained by the school system, either unknowingly or knowingly, to be very, very suspicious of conservative Christianity. And Southern Baptists are considered conservative Christians. Um, so we just need to be thinking about that dynamic. And we, especially you fathers, you need to be the heralding voice in your family, to your children and to your grandchildren, that God is... He is the creator of all things. He loves us. He has a plan and a purpose for us. Because we have advocated that role in our families today and in the workplace and in the government and everywhere else. And look where we are. We need to pick that role back up and we need to grab that sword of the truth of God. And we need to start wielding it again. And we need to start screaming and hollering like all these other crazy groups out there that are getting their way because we're sitting silent. See, I think one of the reasons that we really don't believe like we did because somehow we've lost sight of the truth that there is an eternal destiny that those who do not know Jesus are headed to. And listen to me this morning, it's called hell. Amen. Somebody said that going, man, nobody talks about that anymore. Well, I'm going to just say to you this morning, Jesus talked about it, and that's good enough for me. Amen. I read a story sometime back in my life about a pastor from Chicago. He was in a large church. His uh, office, his study was actually up on the second floor of the church, and he had a large window that was right at his desk. And he could look out on the city streets of Chicago, and you can imagine what that would look like on a bustling Monday or a morning. People everywhere, cars, bum, 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 you know, just backed up. Uh, you get that picture in your mind like you see there in New York City at Times Square or whatever. Thousands and thousands of people up and down the street. And that particular Sunday he had been uh, really convicted to preach a message about hell. And about the destiny of those people who did not know Christ as their Lord and Savior and where they were headed without Jesus. He was so compelled he got up from his seat. He walked over to the window and began to look out over and he saw the countless hundreds and thousands of people. And he knew. He knew that the vast majority of them did not know Jesus. You know, beloved, he was so overcome that morning, he began to just weep. Not, you know, boo hoo hoo, but just tears from his eyes. And he was just gripped with the reality that he and his church in Christ were not making the impact. That they needed to make. Well, one of the deacons popped in the door just like he did every Monday morning to tell the pastor what a good job he did on Sunday, pat him on the back. All of us are looking for a deacon like that instead of the one that comes to fuss at you, you know. But he popped in the door and he immediately saw the countenance on the pastor's face. He could see the glistening of the tear from the sun and he realized maybe something's going on here. I don't know what it is, but I need to comfort my pastor. Praise God for that kind of deacon. Well, he stood for just a moment taking all that in, kind of trying to think, what in the world do I say? And so he remembered the pastor said many times, just a short sentence sometimes and an arm around the shoulder is all you need. So he walked over to his pastor and he did just that. He put his arm around his pastor and he patted him on the shoulder and he said, Pastor, I don't know what you're facing, but don't worry about it. You'll get over it. <laughs> well now, you know, no offense to the brother deacon, he did not know what was going on in the pastor's heart. But can I ask us a question this morning? How long ago, how long ago did you, did I, get over it? I mean, get over that real understanding that hell is a place where Jesus said the worm does not die and the fire is never quenched. A place where you're out of fellowship with God for eternity. A place that there's no coming back from. When is it that we got over the, the reality of the sense that the people that we rub shoulders with at the Walmart and the Kmart and at the uh, grocery store and dig 
just sitting here thinking, maybe I shouldn't ask that question. Maybe since they tell me that possibly as much as 70% of the membership on the rolls of churches in America today never show up, which means most of us are not really Christians. Maybe I should ask the question, did we ever really get it? Let's do that. Let's flip over to Acts for just a minute. 
Look at Acts chapter 1. Scan down to verse 8. Because if you look at Acts chapter 1 and you scan down to verse 8, it says you will receive power. Now, that word behind power there is actually the word dunamis. Now, you know, dynamite's pretty powerful, isn't it? I mean, it'll, it'll blow something up pretty good. I, I see a young guy here, uh, like I was when I was young. Kid, what's your name, buddy? Will. Will. Hey, that's my grandson today. <laughs> well, you and I can have some fun. I, I, I'll take you in the car. We'll go back to my place in West Virginia. I live on eight and a half acres right by the Peckham River. I'm telling you, bro, I got some rocks in my field I need to get rid of. <laughs> you and me, we'll get the hammer drill out and we'll drill a diagonal down into the ground and get us a, a, a thing of dynamite. We'll stick a stick of dynamite in there. I'll even let you light it. I'll tell your mom. <laughs> and you know what we're going to do once we light it, bro? We're going to run. <laughs>
wants them to hear. And then he said, gentlemen, be careful. Be very careful because when you begin to preach, you tell them what you think God meant. Read the Word. Look at Hebrews. God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things. Look at here it is. Here it is. Through whom also He made the world. Look over to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Look at Colossians chapter 1 verses 16 through 17. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things have been created by him, I love this, and for him. Now you know who you're made for. Jesus. He made you and he made you for himself. That's why, listen, go back to verse, uh, go back to chapter uh, 28, verse 18. That's why he says, all exousia has been given to me. Let me go back in my notes here and let me read you a definition of exousia. Here's the definition. Freedom of choice. A right to act, to decide, or does it to dispose of one's property as one wishes? Hello? Hello? He owns us. He owns the world. He can do with it what he pleases. Where else can you get a mandate from the, from the guy at the top? There's no power greater on this earth than the power of the God of the universe. And he manifests himself in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And for whatever reason, he has chosen through his Son to create this incredibly beautiful world that we watched as we drove here today. To create you, an amazing, wonderful human being. And all that is here. And just like if I make something in my little wood shop downstairs and I don't like it, I can throw it in the fireplace. Guess what? He can do that. If I like it, I can take it up and I can put it on the stand and say, look, honey, look what I made. Or if it's like the bed that I made out of maple, we can sleep in it. If it's a chair, I can sit in it. I'll make what I want to do the things I want done. And you know what? If one of the things I made ever looked up at me and said, hey, Ken, I'm not going to be your chair anymore. I might be a little surprised at first. But you know what I would say to that chair? I made you. You don't want to be what I want. I will take you apart. Yes, sir, or I'll throw you in the fire. Because I made it. It's mine. He made us. We are his. You have a mandate. And it comes from the highest authority on... I was going to say the planet, but that's not big enough. <laughs> Job. 
chapter 23. If you can't get there quick enough, man, you just go ahead and jot these down. You can look at them over dinner. This will be the best thing you can do at your father's day meal. But he is unique, Job says, chapter 23, verse 13. And who can turn him? And what his soul desires that he does, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? You know, we tell God what to do when God decides he's going to do something like it. He gets to do it and nobody can say no. That's who you got a mandate from. So why in the world are we pussyfooting around in this culture? Oh, I can't see this at work. I can't see that at work. Hey, as a pastor at Condon Memorial Baptist Church, I was the manager for technology for the U.S. Census Bureau Western Regional Office of Virginia. Do you know what they gave me when I left? That position? They gave me a Bible. A prophecy, I don't know less. Signed by all the staff. How do you reckon they knew I was a Christian? <laughs> I'll tell you how they knew I lived it. I didn't have to preach it, I lived it. I had a smile on my face because I got joy in my heart. I was positive with people and kind to people because the Bible says to do that. Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. I understood the fact that they struggled just like I struggled. In fact, a little lady, I can't even think of her name, it was a little black haired lady right as it came to Do you remember her name? She said, I was just a ray of sunshine, just joy coming into the office. Let me ask you this morning, beloved. Have you gotten over it? Have you ever got it? Are you God's man? Are you God's woman? Are you God's young man, Will? Everywhere that you go. You can be. You won't be watching the television. You will be studying the Word. You won't be listening to your iPod. You will be listening to the Bible on this and your daily Bible reading so that you read the Bible through. If you want to do the one I'm doing, I do the every six months. I'll show you on my, I don't have an iPad, sorry about those that are on my iPad. I'm more of a, uh, what's the other operating system thing? Android. Android, yeah, I'm an Android guy, you know. Android, Android. <laughs> That's who I am, but get your Bible out there and listen to the Word of God. You won't get it in the magazines in the world. You won't get it in the books in the world. Get you an open windows. I know everybody does daily bread. That's not us. We're open windows. And in the middle, all our missionaries are there so you can pray for them. Get serious about your faith because you've got a mandate from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's turning into 22 pages in the day. <laughs> I told her last night, I said, it's too long. But it's the truth. Well, you know what? Look back to the text. It doesn't stop there. you got a mandate. What's your mandate all about? What are you supposed to do? I mean, it's nice to know you got a mandate from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but you know what? There's a lot of people going out there, and they're not doing what the King wants. They're not doing what the Lord wants. They're doing what they want, couching it in Him, and messing up our world. If you don't believe it, go to the Episcopal Church. They'll put homosexual in this preacher. The Bible says that's wrong. The Bible says it's wrong. I don't care how you feel about it. God doesn't care how you feel. He cares about what He said. Now, I guarantee if you read His Word, you will feel differently about it. If you feel that it's a positive thing, you'll also feel great compassion and a great sense of urgency. And I know this sounds really weird, but it's true. You will feel a great love for them. In fact, I actually had pastor churches where I had homosexuals coming to my church. I couldn't believe they kept coming because I kept preaching against it. <laughs> but you know what? They wanted the truth, but even more, I, I shake their hand and hug them. Jesus loved everybody. And you know what? You should have met Pastor Ken before he was Pastor Ken. Well, no, you shouldn't. I'm glad you didn't. And you know what? If you do Pastor Ken's life, well, he was Pastor Ken. He's had some stumbles and some rough rocks. But you know what's so cool about Jesus? His mandate isn't stopped by my mistakes. Can I say that again? His mandate does not stop by my mistakes. Because like old Bruce Carroll said, he picks me up in that song. He dusts me off and he puts me on a pattern. Isn't that what Romans says? The gift and the calling of God are irrevocable. Ooh, howdy. Isn't that cool? God's calling your life. Nobody can take it away. It's irrevocable. Jesus, Jesus holds you in the palm of his hands. Because he gave you a mandate. He's got a mission for you. Well, look at the mission. What does the mission say? Go therefore, verse 19 says. You look at back in your text. Go therefore, and here it is, make disciples. That's the only real verb in there. The rest of them are those uh, the ING things. What do they call the ING? Any English, any English teachers? What's those ING 
G words? Jarens. Jarens, something like that. Yeah. This is the only verb. Make a disciple of all the nations. And then all these ING things. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that commend you. But what's the real object that you and I are supposed to achieve? Make a disciple. Hello, Jack. Let me say something to you. That's a whole lot harder than sharing your faith. And getting somebody to say, oh yeah, I accept Jesus and pray the prayer. Because you know what? I have been all over this world. From Africa to Ukraine to Romania to Brazil. And I've had a lot of people accept Jesus. But they did it because I was there. And I was an American. Now some of them I know were sincere, but many of them I don't think were. See, there's a big difference in just sharing your faith and getting somebody to say yes to a question than there is in taking that person under your wing. And beginning to live your life in front of them so that they can see Jesus in you, or in you, or you, or even in will. There's a big difference. A big difference. Can somebody feel the Spirit in your life? Are you on mission for Jesus? Are you living your life in such a way that the world sees that there's something different about you? Something that is outside the norm of what they're seeing everywhere else? Do you have that smile? Do you have that charisma? Do you have that joy that the Bible speaks of that is down in the depths of your insides that no one can take away because you know that your life is safe in Christ. You know that if you die, you're going to heaven. You know that if you have a crisis or an accident in your life, that God will carry you through, that the family of God will be there for you. You know these things. So we live with a peace and a hope and a joy that the rest of the world doesn't have. What does that mean? That means I don't have to be all nervous about everything else that's going on out there. When all this news media hype comes on and the tornadoes are coming and the hurricanes are coming and the world is blowing apart and falling apart and people are dying, it's okay. If I'm one of the dead, cool, I'm in heaven. Hello? My wife is taken care of because he, he, he loves her more than I'll ever be able to love her and I love her a lot. Hey, and if I'm one of the ones that lost everything just now, guess what? I still got the king. I'm still his son. And I will always be. From the day of my birth, well, no, yes, my birth as a Christian, to the day of my death in the human life, and for eternity on, I always live. So I can live through anything. I can do, what does it say? All things through Him who strengthens me. Are you living in that power this morning? Do you understand that not only do you have a mandate, you have a mission, and it is to make a disciple. Dad, listen to me. Serious business. I love the passage that y'all read this morning from 1 John. In fact, I got a series of messages on that passage. I got another series on another passage very similar to that in the book of Titus. Excellent, excellent stuff. Y'all read those books. Guys, go home, take it back out, read it to your family again today. Go over and read the Titus. Titus is real short. You can read it in one sitting. You can probably do it while they're eating their meal, and then you won't eat. You'll be better off because you'll start to lose a little bit of that. I told my wife the other day, I think I'm starting to get not just a tire around here. I think I'm getting one of those truck tires. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so you don't need to read the Bible. Give them the Word of God. Because, hey, then, listen. We are His emissaries for our family. You, meant, yes, sir, you are the one that spirituality is supposed to give us. Not a moment that ought to be getting up on Sunday, dragging the kids out of the bed and getting them ready for church. It ought to be you. It ought to be you. That's our responsibility. No, that's our privilege. Our privilege. Well, you got a mandate from the King of Kings and from the Lord of Lords. You got a mission. What is that mission? Make a disciple. It's a lot harder to make a disciple than just make a convert. We need to be living for Jesus in everything we say and everything that we do. But let me just say to you, the world is not going to like you if you do that. If they didn't like Jesus, why do you think they'd like you? And so you need to be ready. You need to be ready, every one of you, to buck up a little bit because the world is going to come against you. We used to be one nation under God. We are a nation that was founded on Christian principles. I know the kids are not being taught that today in school. In fact, they're being taught otherwise. But that's, that's a lie. And the truth is, we are a Christian nation. You don't believe it? Go and just read the writings of our founders. They talk about Thomas Jefferson wanted a, you know, a, a, what do you call it? A, I don't know. A, 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 a godless society. Not a godless society. What's the word that I'm looking for? I mean, it's a nation that basically is just pagan, but I can't think of the real word that I'm looking for. But that's not what he wanted at all. I mean, this is a president that had Bibles printed for the Indians. Hello. With federal funds. This is the president that put the uh, worship service in the Capitol building and had the Marines.
Marlene Band come and play for the worship service. And it's our fault. It's our fault. It's our fault as Christians for not being a Christian nation, for not upholding that standard. It's even our fault for not putting a man that's in there that's Christian. Your first, uh, your first chief justice of the United States said that we should prefer Christians for our leader. You can't give somebody the kind of power that our government gives and expect them to do right if they're not a Christian. They're going to use it for their own benefit or for whatever agenda they have. Oh, beloved, our kids are being brainwashed. We are listening to the stuff on the media. Perhaps someone should remind the three branches of our government that we are one nation under God. I think they could stand to hear that. Because they're hearing everything else. Does it bother you? Does it bother you? Yes. yes. Thank you. It bothers me. The question is, does it bother us enough that we will get serious about the mandate we have and the mission given to make a disciple? You see, you don't have to worry about the people at, that are outside your sphere of influence. All you got to do is influence the ones that you're near. That's all you got to do. Be God's man. Be God's woman. Be God's young man. Be God's young lady. Right where you are. Don't let their bad jokes, don't let their ideology, don't let their uh, lifestyle come onto you. Let yours be impacting them. Let yours be impacting them. Live your life for Jesus. As a Christian, we should be striving every day to live a full and meaningful Christian life. That's who we ought to be. That's what we ought to be about. But let me just say again, you are in a culture today just like Peter and them were. Do you think Rome was very positive to the Christian uh, advent of Christianity? Hey, do you think the Jews were positive to the advent of Christianity? They had it from all sides. They had it from the religious world and they had it from the political world. Well, let me just say to you, beloved, Peter had something to say to them when they told him to don't. Flip over to Acts again, chapter 5. This is a verse you all write down in our world today. Acts chapter 5. Scan down to verse 29. I don't know, I don't know why I'm so slow today. Well, let's go back to 27. When they, brought, when they had brought them, they stood them before the council. Ooh, howdy, you're in court. I'm a former cop. I know what that feels like. And even when you're in the right, you know what you feel in court? And nervous. Even in a uniform, I felt nervous. So they're in court. The high priest questioned him, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. And Peter said, and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. Burn it in your brains. We must obey God rather than man. Listen to me, beloved. Just as those men stood for Jesus, we need to rise up once again and take hold of the leadership role in our families. We need to, just like those men say, that we are going to do God's bidding. Remember what old Joshua said at the end of his book? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That is our mandate, beloved, and our mission is to live it out. And Jesus Christ himself has called us to live that out. You know what's really kind of nice still about America? Your constitution says you get to, even though the courts are trying to say you don't. That's right. First Amendment. Anybody know the First Amendment? Let me just read it to you. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Someone please tell the Joint Chiefs that truth. So they'll get off the chaplain's backs and quit telling them they can't pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Then they'll stop telling them they can't proselytize the other soldiers that desperately need hope, that desperately need life, that desperately need Jesus. Somebody please tell the Congress who prays still and has a, a, a chaplain do that and the Senate and for some, please someone tell the Supreme Court 
justices. Listen to me, beloved. The reality is we have a mandate, and that mandate gives us a mission, and the mission is to make a disciple, and you and I are the only ones that can do that. Nobody else will, because they're not a Christian. So, here's your question, and mine. Who are you discipling? Yeah. Who are you discipling? Intentionally, personally, showing them how it looks for a Christian to handle a crisis. Personally, actively, showing them how it looks to receive praise and benefit as a Christian. Who are you discipling? Hey, Dad. Hello, Dads. Your sons and your daughters. Your wife. The Bible has a lot to say about love your wife like Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Willing to die for it. By the way, that's the easy thing. Easy to die. <laughs> Gone. No more problem. The question is, are you willing to, what does it say, make your life a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable? Well, the passage doesn't end there either, does it? Not only do you have a mission from that mandate, beloved, but you do not have to guess what to say. Look what it says in verse 20. Do you see all this in here? Am I just crazy? Or I'm, I'm loving the book. I mean, you know, I just love the book. What does it say in verse 20? You don't have to guess. Jesus says, teach them to observe all that I command you. I'm sure glad he didn't say obey because sometimes I found flounder. But I, I know it. I'm supposed to be observing it. I'm supposed to be seeing it. I'm supposed to be understanding it. And then as he empowers me, I do try to live it by his help. And in my better moments, I do okay. And Lord God, help me increase my better moments. But there are times when I fail. And there are times when you fail. But that does not stop you from teaching them to observe all that Jesus commanded you. So you got a mandate. And that mandate is to make a disciple. And you don't have to guess what to say. It's all right here. Does anybody... Let me ask my man Will again. I appreciate you helping me today. It's nice to always have somebody in the world that I can connect with. Will, do you know John 3.16? Do you know that Bible verse? For God so loved the world. Have you ever heard that one? Yeah. He's shaking his head. He knows that verse. And it, 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 let's get them to help us. Can you all say that? For God so, so loved, loved the world, world that he gave his only son, son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, we learned that part. Do me a favor today. I want you to go home, Will. Read that one, but read the next one. Because you know what the next one says, buddy? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Boy, I wish I had memorized that part, too. I mean, I love John 3.16, but do me a favor. Add 17 to it, because that's the heart in which you are to live out the mandate. And that is the essence of the message of the gospel. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That's good news. That's awesome news. It's a, I'm going to jump over this pulpit. It's a great thing to know that God loves you so much. He is willing, beloved, to send His Son to die for you. And that Jesus was literally willing to take off the robes of heaven, set them aside, come down to this earth, be born as a little teenager. Baby, be subject to Satan and his attack and live his life perfectly so he might die in your place and pay your price. <laughs> it is incredible. What's that new show, The Incredibles? They got nothing on Jesus. I saw some kids playing with those little creature things or whatever today. That's the end. They got nothing on Jesus. Hey, man, listen to me. It is our responsibility to get that message out and to let the kids know, to let our sons and daughters know, to let our wife know that they are precious to us just because they are precious to God and that we love them because He loved us first. Oh, man, we need to live out that message. And listen to me, guys. You can't teach what you don't know. Learn the book. Learn the book. Get the message of the gospel in your heart and your mind so that you will know that you have a mandate. You will have confidence in where it comes from. You will know what the mandate is all about, that there is a mission that you are on every single day. When you wake up in the morning, you ought to sit up and attention and say, Private Kenny Goose, you're for duty, sir. What do you want? 
church. Yeah, that's it. That's it! That is the mission! You don't have to get them saved. That's Jesus' job. But you have to live right and speak right and what? Teach them what the book says. And you know what? If you teach it and you don't live it, they're going to laugh. But if you live it and you're teaching it, they got one or two choices. He makes me mad because I don't like who he is. He's consistent. I hate that. I'm going to kill him. That's what they did to Jesus. Or, or, They'll say, God, help me. I wish I could be like that. God, forgive me. You know what? That'll move into this. And one day they'll bend the knee. And they will say, Lord Jesus, save me. I'd much rather than bend the knee now. Because the Bible says one day every knee will bow. And everyone will confess that Jesus is Lord of the Lord God. But it will be too late. What are you doing about the message and the mission? What are you doing to reach those guys at the golf course and those gals at the golf course? Can you send me to time out? We had church in Walmart parking lot. I ought to get a tent rented every week and put up the Walmart parking lot. And guess what? I would have crowds. They started hearing me hollering, screaming like this, and they would come over and say, Who is this crazy man? <laughs> but I'd at least have a crowd. Ah, <laughs> uh, you got a few seats available here. Don't you? Let's get a full! How do you do it, Pastor Kid? You know what? Dr. Rayner wrote a book. Surprising insights from the recently unchurched. He went around the survey to find out why did people come back to church. You know what the number one answer was? Because some close personal friend or family member invited them. Hello! What? You mean personal events is the worst? Some close personal friend invited them. Is that you? Is that me? Can it be? Yes, it can. But I can't do it for you. And neither can your preacher. But you can do it. Because you got a mandate from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he's put you on a mission to live your life, to live the Christian life with victory and confidence, with courage. And he's giving you a message. You ain't got to guess what to say. Learn John 3.16 and 17. Remember, Will. It's 3.16 and 17. Because with that one or two verses, you got a great gospel presentation. And do me a favor. Next time you're in the line at the grocery store, don't do what you normally do. <laughs> Looking at the magazines. You don't look at them anyway. I mean, it's amazing what garbage they have on them nowadays. They don't even let you see the covers on them. Do me a favor. Look at the person in front of you and go. <laughs> or turn around and look at. The... What's the little girl on uh, that show that was going to do the smile thing? Sue. Sue. Like Sue Heck. Oh, on that Indiana the show. Where the middle. Came. The middle. The middle. The smile. It's contagious. You know what you might also try? Just say to somebody, hey, God loves you. And he wants you to have a full and meaningful life. And then whip out your card that you made on your computer that says Valley Baptist Church. And on the back it says, we're having a great time in Jesus. And it's got a little map. And hand it to him. Can you do that? Hey, God bless you. That's simple. Or if you're really courageous, the one I really like the best. Hey, God loves you. And he wants you to have a full and meaningful life. Come to Valley Baptist. I'll say it one more time. Write it down. Hey. Hey! <laughs> God loves you. And he wants you to have a full and meaningful life. Hand the card. And if they respond positively, hey, where do you live? My wife and I will drive by and you can follow us to church Sunday. Yeah. A personal invitation. The number one reason you can come back to church. Are you giving it? Missions mandate. You will be my witnesses, Jesus said. Are we? Are we? Yes. It's my prayer that Valley Baptist will be. You got a fire facility. I hear you building more. It's a shame. So many of us. And I know some people are visiting me. You tell them they missed it today. You had a fun time.
Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for who you are and for your 